welcome to another episode. In this episode, we will take the half steel we created and turn it into a pretty knife. If you have not watched the half steel episode, you might want to take a look now. What we just extracted is a pack of high carbon steel that needs to be significantly consolidated and refined before it can be used. The first step can happen immediately after the pack was taken out of the fire. It is surprising that even though we only put in roughly 10,050 gram, that we did not lose more material. What I am showing now is some of the steps of folding and forge welding the puck until it turns into usable material. This is surprisingly time intensive and also a little bit error prone as the material is quite dirty and they need to be able to remove all inclusions. The first step is to cut it in half on the bandsaw. In later stages we will also hot cut and fold it. However, since it's cold at the moment, we are just cutting it up, which also allows us to take a look inside. Afterwards, we clean up the surfaces and prepare a billet for forge welding in the forge. The idea of forge welding is twofold. We want to remove any impurities which melt out at higher temperatures, but we also want to homogenize the material to even out the carbon content. Here is something you definitely do not want to repeat. I had placed a piece of charcoal into the forge to verify that the atmosphere was reducing. I went through a double check on that, as I don't want a rich atmosphere to eat the carbon in the puck. After I get it to forge welding temperatures, this is where the flux is liquid and bubbly, I am working the billet with swift hits from the power hammer. This should set the weld well. In another pass, Tony and I are working the billet in turns on the anvil. All in all, this video is covering short windows into around 8 folds of the material. As you can see, there is progressively less and less of the steel. The fastest way to fold is to cut the material when it's hot. To do that, I'm using a handheld chisel and try to cut through most of the material. The billet can then be folded on top of each other with a little bit of flux added, and then it goes back into the forge for the next round of forge welding. The folding is a little challenging, and I just lost the handle, so I'm trying to fold on the narrow part of the anvil so that I can use my tongs. At this point, we have lost more than half of the material, and it still looks fairly problematic. I'm curious how much knife will be left at the end. To test the quality of the welds, I upset the billet. Unfortunately, it showed that there were pockets inside of the billet that had not welded. I am cutting them open and hope that one more round of very hot forge welding might take care of it. At least, I still have enough material to make a knife-sized billet. As this is my first time consolidating my own hearth steel, I'm really not looking for perfection. My hope, though, is that I will end up with something that can show off some interesting patterns in the steel. You probably know already that the very existence of this video is a likely indication that there was some success at the end. However, at this point in filming, I'm feeling quite frustrated. It looks like this actually worked quite well, and I am preparing a final fold. Afterwards, no matter how the material looks like, I will forge it into a knife. Unfortunately, that was easier said than done. This looks quite terrible and I have no idea if it can be rescued. Let's do the cutting and stacking one more time. All right, this is it. I will forge a knife now and we will see how that is going to work. My first step is to taper towards the tip, which will gain me more length. The next step is to isolate the material for the tang, for which I always like to use my little blacksmith helper. The power hammer then allows me to make quick progress and forge out the tang to an even width in much more length. For the shaping of the tip, I am forging at a 45 degree angle at the outside edge of my anvil.
this is starting to look quite nice, and the next step is to forge in the start of the bevel, which will really create the knife shape. At this point, I'm also switching over to a smaller hammer, since I'm really only forging a tiny knife here. One of the challenges when forging a knife is to create enough width at the tank to blade transition, so I'm focusing a little bit more attention there. This is all the forging that I will do, and before I transition over to the grinder, I will normalize the blade to relieve some of the forging stresses. In theory, we should have been able to see some recalcitrance, but due to the light, it's not easily visible. Now, we get to the most time-consuming and frankly most boring part of making a knife, and that is spending time in front of the grinder. The push stick allows me to remove material more aggressively, which helps speed things up at the beginning. Before heat treating, I go to some finer belts to remove the scratch marks from the coarse belts I used at the beginning. Before heat treating, I normalize the blade one more time and let it slowly cool down. Once it no longer glows, I'm putting it back in the forge and then quickly plunge it into my high-speed quenching oil. Usually after quenching, the pattern in the steel is easily visible. So let's take a look. And of course, this looks much nicer in person, but I'm trying to get a good angle on this video. To check if the knife is hard, which given that this is experimental steel is something we should question, we can use a file. If the knife is hard, we will just skate off the steel, otherwise it will bite. Guess what? It's back to the grinder. This time I need to be careful not to get the knife too hot, as to not to ruin the temper. Tempering is something I did already, but did not capture on video. I just stuck it in the oven, around 400 Fahrenheit or so. After hardening, I can also put in a more aggressive tang to blade transition, which I need to do to fit a brass bolster later on. Cool, I am pretty happy with the shape, and the edge is thin enough to sharpen on a stone. Let's put it in ferric chloride to reveal the pattern we have in the steel. What we have created here is in many ways very similar to the steel used in Japanese swords. However, the steel there gets folded many more times to create much more subtle patterns. What I am doing here is what you might have seen in a European Viking Age knife. After a moment of suspense, it turns out the pattern is quite difficult to see on the video. Well, let's remove the oxides and engage in some polishing. I believe you will find the pattern quite pretty. At least I thought it came out quite nice. If you are wondering what I'm doing here, I'm using Mother's Metal Polish to remove the oxides and then use a combination of ferrous oxide and oil to create a matte finish. And here's the result. The blade looks really pretty, even though there are some significant welding flaws. This would definitely not win a prize, but I'm happy with it. To finish the knife, I plan on making a very simple brass bolster. I'm using my goldsmithing bench and equipment, which comes in handy when working with non-ferrous metals. As always, I'm sure there are faster ways of doing this, but I'm not in this for speed or money. So in many ways, I like to do things in a way that almost lead to some kind of work meditation. Since the material is brass, it is quite soft. To create a great fit with the tang of the knife, I can actually use the tang as a drift to open up a perfectly fitting channel in the brass. For right now, I'm just trying to get something to get close to the proper shape, but that is not too large.
There is one more thing I do. I am also driving the blade into the brass to create a perfect transition from the bolster to the blade. For this to work, the brass needs to be quite soft, so I am quickly annealing it. Unfortunately, I forgot to film the part where I drive the blade into the brass. However, you will see at the end of this video that there really is a good fit. To create the rough shape of the bolster, I am drawing an oval by hand on the brass and then roughly follow the outline with my jeweler's saw. I will refine the shape once I'm working on the wooden handle. Back at the shop, I took a block of curly maple that I had purchased quite a few years ago and am now measuring it to receive the tang of the knife. I usually like to burn the tang in and need to know where to drill the pilot hole. I am drawing a rough outline of the tang on the wood and then will also measure where the center of the hole is going to be on the block in relation to the tang. A good pilot hole makes burning in the tang much easier, or so I hope we will see. Before I go ahead I want to make sure that I am finding the right size drill bit, so I am checking it against both my drawn outline and the tang. This seems to fit well, and so let's start to drill the hole. Hopefully at the right angle and keeping the drill bit centered in the middle of my piece of wood. The first hole is with a smaller pilot bit, and then I am following up with the size I had selected. I am driving the tang into the wood a little bit to help with orienting it during the burn-in. Burning the tang into the wood for the handle is an easy way to get a good fit. It depends a little bit on the wood though, and some woods are more difficult than others. You might worry that I am ruining the hardness of my cutting edge, however, metal is not a good heat conductor, so if I am just heating up at the end of the tang, it will not affect the hardness of the blade. You can see this when I'm cooling down the tang. The water only boils at the end and not all the way through. Unfortunately, I was a little bit over eager when burning in the tang and the fit is much sloppier than I would have liked. I sometimes prefer to finish a knife only with a friction fit. However, in this case, I will need to glue it up first and then finish the handle and the bolster with everything glued together. At this point though, I still have a lot of excess material that I can remove before a close fit really becomes important. The bandsaw comes in handy for this, however, at the shop I only have a metal bandsaw which does not cut wood well at all. It's still an easy way to quickly remove the excess. Before I end up gluing the brass bolster to the blade and wooden handle, I might as well polish it to a mirror surface. This will be much more difficult once everything is attached. When shaping the handle, I will likely ruin some of it, but I can fix that later fairly easily. On the right I am using a cutting compound called ZAM, and on the left a polishing rouge. For gluing everything together, I am using a slow setting two component epoxy. One of these days I should use the cutler's resin I have made from beeswax and pitch, however this always seems like it would be such a mess that I have so far refrained from using it. This epoxy has been working well for me and it has not come apart on knives I have made many years ago.
However, even the epoxy is a mess, and I was not quite sure how much I would really need of it. For the excess that I'm squeezing out, I'm using denatured alcohol to clean it up, which seems to be working reasonably well. On the wood at least, all the material removal will get rid of everything that's built on the handle, you will see. For now, I'm using my handy pipe clamps and will let the epoxy cure overnight. In this video, you can tell this transition only because of my switch and t-shirts. Now that everything is one piece, I am using a coarse belt on the belt sander to remove the obvious excess. This requires quite careful operation, because the belt sander can remove material very, very quickly. One of the challenges with my setup is that the platform is only 2 inches wide. If I had a much wider sanding belt, it would be easier to keep clean lines. For that reason, I prefer to use some hand tools as well, because they provide more feedback. That said, keeping clean lines with a file is tricky as well. In my case, I want the end of the handle to be slightly thicker and taller than the wood at the bolster. The slack belt on the grinder, when used carefully, is another reasonable way for shaping the handle. I am using finer belts here, and then move over to finishing the handle with fine sandpaper. The handle is really a very basic shape, so I don't need to take a lot of care to keep any lines. In some sense, a slightly organic shape works well for my aesthetics. To finish the wood, I'm using a combination of tongue oil and boiled linseed oil. This creates a very durable finish on the wood and looks quite nice. It's definitely not historically accurate. The benefit though is that the coat is dry in two hours and can be reapplied multiple times within a single day. I repeat this every two hours for about five coats. In between coats, I always apply a little steel wool to remove any raised grains. Once this is done, I'm using the fine steel wool one more time and make sure that the whole handle feels very smooth to the touch. At this point, the finish on the handle is quite hard and the character of the wood shows through nicely. The final application of the sandpaper on the wooden handle left some scratches in the brass. I'm taping off the wood here and then will use a sanding stick to remove the scratches that are visible. To be honest, fit and finish is something that I'm not very good at and at this point in the process I frequently just want to get done. However, removing of scratches it is. Afterwards, the knife is basically finished, but for sharpening. However, the masking tape probably left some glue residue on the blade, and after removing it, I'm polishing a little bit with oil and red iron oxide. As you can see while I'm still working on the last few steps, the knife is very simple, with very simple lines. The taper of the blade is slightly continued into the handle, and the overall handle length is about the same as the length of the blade. To really make it a knife though, it needs a sharp cutting edge. I'm not showing all steps here, but I'm starting with a coarse oil stone, and then continue into a medium, and then a fine India stone. Because this steel is really somewhat experimental, I did not thin the edge down as much as I would with a modern steel knife. Because of that, I need to aggressively cut a secondary bevel on the sharpening stones. This is meant to be a general purpose knife for just carrying around. So while it will open a banana easily, it's not terribly well suited for cutting vegetables. The knife and handle don't leave space for a cutting board, and the overall knife is much too thick. However, 
It could do well cutting bread, branches and bananas. Everything that starts with a B, really. I had mentioned fit and finish. In my opinion, the transition from the blade to the bolster really needs to be clean. And while that is not necessarily my forte, let's take a look. This looks pretty good to me, and sinking the blade into the soft brass really helped with closing any gaps here. Overall, I'm quite happy with the end result. Let's do some very light cutting as well, using some cardboard I had lying on the table. You can see that it's mostly sharp, but the one cut reveals an area where I probably need to go back and sharpen some more. You might worry about how to sharpen the knife directly at the bolster, and the answer is that the knife will not be sharp there, and that's completely fine. Thanks to all my supporters on Patreon. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. My video production has been somewhat slow lately due to me having less time at the shop. However, I will see you next time.